flow from the vessel. vessel. Are there many needs that we have? We have many needs. There's not one in this congregation that doesn't have a need. And I would pray God will address everyone. I pray that we would get as we can together. So I want to acknowledge something this morning, brothers and sisters. I want to acknowledge the tremendous loss of the Mount Health Church in the past two weeks. Forgive me, you all know me. You know this was an act. I can't recall it. Brother Carl Kirshner, his wife, Judy. <coughs> Brother Chip Chipanowski, Brother Chipanowski. Brother John Chipanowski and his wife, uh, Mary, I believe. His wife, Mary. Uh, Brother Alex Cherry. Brother Jim Dusan. My mom was. And uh, to say that our hearts have been praying for them on the head of branch, understand. We, we felt the loss for the brand. We felt the loss of them from the general church, from the region, and from the branch. And we want to let you know that we'll continue. Uh, we will be in prayers. I would ask this morning that you would remember our two brothers in their calling. They have a little bit more responsibility. And that's basically the responsibility. The responsibility is just increase the way. And I want to challenge you this morning to pray for our brothers in that responsibility and in their calling. But I want to tell you what's even a higher calling. A higher calling to that is each and every one of you what we have received in obeying the gospel. That's the highest call. You, the followers of Christ, have gained the highest calling that there is on this face of this earth. I just want to read, share a brief scripture with you. Turn it over to Brother Wayne. In the 10th chapter of Luke. And you know, God does everything in his perfect order. There's a perfect order that Christ has. And I believe he spells that perfect order out right here. 10th chapter of Luke, and it says, after he had sent the 70 out, they returned. He says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devil, devils are subject unto us through, through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from him. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And that's what he was telling them. And then he says this. Notwithstanding this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That is the highest call, and each of us that has rendered obedience unto Jesus Christ has that call today. And I want us to understand that this morning. We have the highest call in this gospel and on the face of this earth. These brothers, just a little bit more responsibility. So pray for them. We uh, anticipate a wonderful day this morning. I'm going to turn it over to Brother Wayne, and uh, and we're going to go from there. Please have a prayer in your heart that God will bless us today. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Brother Wayne has asked us to sing number 448. Are you able to sit in that school? Number 448. Let's sing. First. Third and last verse. First, third, and last.
brothers and sisters and friends. Welcome to the Church of Jesus Christ. Brother Brandon, how's the uh, volume in the back? We're thankful to see each of you. And as I look out on the congregation, I see uh, many of our new converts, which is certainly a blessing. And I see uh, Brother Bufa here with us somewhere that was just uh, ordained a few weeks ago, and that's certainly a blessing as well. I wanted to start this morning by sharing that the reason that we're here is because the direction of the Lord, the guidance and the direction of God, fasting and praying. It's no secret that the church of Jesus Christ is always looking for laborers. Christ said that himself. He said that the, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And as we were laid upon our heart that we would seek God for additional labors in, into the evangelist quorum of 70, One night the Lord spoke to us in a dream, and he said these words, I have called those that you have not yet considered. Brothers, I want you to remember those words. I know you have your own callings, but know that the Lord said he's called those that we had not yet considered, and your brothers are two of those. And so we began to have discussion and more prayer and fasting with the the leaders of the evangelists in the different regions following the, the process, but it, it became a serious matter of prayer, and the Lord gave guidance and direction. And brothers and sisters, in a relatively short period of time, and Brother Bob uh, Nicklow was, was with me as vice president every step of the way. And in a short time, the Lord began to call. And it's important that you know this morning, as our, our brother John Mark said, that the most important calling is the calling to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would repent of our sins, we would go to the waters of baptism, be immersed in that liquid grave, come out as a new creature in Christ, have hands laid upon us for the reception of the Holy Ghost, and as the Scripture says, that we would walk through that gate that takes us onto the straight and narrow road, and that our desire is that we would remain on that straight and narrow road until the end of our life, and that we would be faithful and dedicated in one day that we would see the throne of God and the Lord Jesus Christ sitting at his right-hand side, welcoming us in to the portals of glory. But also know that the Lord is not done calling. And I say especially to the young people, and I'll let you decide if you're in that category or not, right? It says it's time for the young men to come to the aid of their country, their spiritual country. It's time for young women who love the Lord to stand, to stand up and declare your dedication and your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his church says that there's no room on the sideline and there's no room on the back line. Sometimes we want to hide, don't we? We want to go where we can't be noticed. But there's no room for those two places. He said, but only the front lines are calling and serving for more. And so we need to be on the front line today, brothers and sisters. And, and brothers, you're going to be on the front line. You have been as ministers of the gospel. But the Lord's going to bring you a little further to the front. But stay humble, that the Lord can use you. I'd like to share a passage of Scripture with you, a very familiar passage. It's the uh, testimony of Isaiah in the sixth chapter. I'm not going to do very much reading, but I'll read a few verses just for the background. So starting at the beginning, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So the prophet Isaiah saw the Lord in, in this experience. Above it stood the seraphims, or the angels. Each one had six wings. 
With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I want you to be able to proclaim this morning, although you might not do it out loud, that you might be able to proclaim this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ is holy. He's the holy of holies. He's the first and the last. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the foundation that we stand upon. And without that foundation, the scripture says that no man and no woman can stand. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now listen to what Isaiah says. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah declares his shortcomings. He declares his insufficiencies. He declares that he's not perfect. And brothers and sisters, I'll speak for me first. That describes us perfectly, doesn't it? No matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we strive for that mark of perfection, and yet we have shortcomings in our life. We have flaws in our life. But I tell you this morning that perfection is not required to serve the Lord. Perfection is not required to be called of the Lord for additional responsibility. And here's why. Then flew one of the seraphims, one of the angels, unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. And thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. I want you to go back with me for a moment. Do you remember that day? No matter how long ago, no matter where it was. Do you remember the touch of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ upon you? And I don't know whether it was a long struggle for you or a short one. I don't know if it was a bitter struggle or if it came easily. Mine was a little bit long. Mine was a little bit bitter. It felt like a tug of war. But oh, that day when I stood up on my feet and said these words that I'm tired of fighting the things of God, now I want to fight against the enemy of my soul, and I submitted, and I surrendered to the Lord. And thank God from that day until now, I've had no regrets of that decision. And for the first time in my life, I felt clean, and I felt free of that burden of sin that, that so easily beset me. Every one of us need, needed that experience. The whole world needs that experience. And the last verse I'm going to read. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Isaiah answered, Here am I, send me. Do you feel that way this morning, brothers and sisters and friends? Here am I, send me, is a front lines response. It's not a sidelines response. It's not a back lines response. And Sister Lisa, Sister Rachel, I know this is ordination of, of your husbands, but you're a key part of this. Your love, your support, your patience, your understanding. Without that, we can't labor for the Lord the way that we do and the way that we need to. 
And so you'll be in our prayers also, along with your entire family. But what makes us say, brothers and sisters, what gives us that desire to say, here am I, Lord, send me? It's not because we're capable. It's not because we're able. It's not because we're talented or because we're gifted. It's because we realize that we have been converted. We realize that we stand in the strength of the Lord. And whatever gifts and talents and abilities that the Lord has given us, let us use them for our honor and glory for the Lord's honor and glory, for the church's honor and glory, not for ourselves. And the Lord is the great multiplier. If you have a desire to use that gift to build his kingdom, he's going to expand that gift. He's going to multiply that gift. He's going to give you a gift that you didn't even know that you had or you didn't even know that you possessed as long as it remains for his honor and for his glory. What would make us say, here am I, Lord, send me? Because of the love that we have for the souls of men and women. We knew the condition that we were in. We knew that there was nothing but the spirit of God and the spirit of repentance and that spirit of conversion that could change our life. We tried to do it on our own. It didn't work. The Lord had to overcome us. The Lord had to consume us with his spirit. And we had to surrender unto him. Brothers, the strongest desire for you as evangelists is the souls of men and women that are dying in sin and shame in this world. And if you say, oh, well, what's, what's one soul? Well, let me ask the question a different way. What if that one soul was yours or that one soul was mine? Is there any distance that's too far to travel for that soul or any amount of time that's too much to take or any sacrifice that's too great? You see, we say, here am I, send me, because we believe that we're going to go in the strength of the Lord. And that even before we go, that the Lord is going to go before us and prepare the way. He's going to open the door. And as he told the churches of Philadelphia, he said, I give unto you an open door. And when I open it, no man can shut it. And when I shut it, no man can open it. You see, we need to be about our father's business, brothers and sisters. As Jesus said when he was about to begin his ministry, we need to be about our father's business. I, I love the words of, of Nephi when he went back to get the plates, and I, I use them often because it fits so many situations. The Lord spoke to him and said, I won't give you anything to do unless I prepare a way for you to accomplish it. So for those of you that were just baptized or baptized decades ago, know that in God calling you, his desire is that we would run the race to the end. He didn't call us that we might stop short or that we might take a detour. He places us upon that straight and narrow road, and Christ many times beckons us to come unto him, that we would run that race to the end. And if we're able to run that race to the end with our brothers and sisters, supported by our prayers, supported by our fellowship, can you... See yourself in the kingdom of God today. It's important to do enough. I don't want to be the one when I'm standing before the Lord that would have to be ashamed, that I would have regrets, that I would have done more, that I would have done something to build up the church, to reach out to the souls of men and women and to invite them and to attract them with the Spirit of God into his church. Brother John read it this morning. The evangelist couldn't believe what was happening as the Lord sent them out. He sent them out two by two, so if you can imagine, there's 70 men. He sent out groups of two to 35 different places. 
And he said afterwards, the Lord was going to go there to those places and confirm. And the Lord gave me some inspiration on one of those verses that Brother John said. That it says, the spirits are subject unto you. Brothers, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to pray about it. The spirits are subject unto you. The spirit of affliction, the spirit of discouragement, the spirit of de depression and anxiety, the spirit of despair, the spirit of financial loss and of mourning, those spirits are going to be subject unto you because of this calling that you might do it for the honor and glory of God and you might do it for the welfare of every soul that you come in contact with. Leave an imprint upon their soul of your ministry and your work as an evangelist. We have to be led and we have to be guided by God. But we can't just sit and wait idly by. And I'll just close with a few words about the evangelist Philip. You know, Philip started out as a deacon. He had the calling as a deacon, and, and Jesus said, if you prove faithful in little things, I'll bless you with greater things. So whatever you're doing now, brothers and sisters and friends for the Lord, whatever you're doing, do it faithfully. Do it diligently. Do it willingly. Do it with all your heart and with all your soul. And eventually, the Lord called Philip as an evangelist. And Philip followed the direction of the Lord. As he was in and around Jerusalem, an angel came to him. It said, Philip, I want you to go to, to Gaza. There's a desert down there. There's a, a man that needs to hear the gospel, one man, the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was obedient. You know, brothers and sisters, it's a wonderful thing to ask the Lord for direction. But it's only wonderful if we follow the direction once he gives it. Other than that, it's better that we don't ask. Don't mind me saying that. <laughs> so Philip went and he found an Ethiopian man, a eunuch who was one of the servants of the queen, Candace, Candace, whatever you want to call her. And he was reading the scripture. He was reading Isaiah also, only a different chapter. But he didn't understand do you know how little understanding there is in this world today of the Word of God? Some people try to read. They try to figure it out. They try to understand. They need our help, brothers and sisters. They, they need us to interpret the meaning and the patient, the understanding of the Scripture. And, and the Word of God said that Philip joined himself with that eunuch in the chariot, and he began to preach Christ unto him. And he wasn't there for days or weeks, just a short time. And the eunuch was converted. He was ready for baptism. Just one problem. They were in the desert. You know, brothers, as you go out, if you're in the desert and somebody wants to be converted, the Lord's going to provide water for you because it's already happened. He provided water. He was baptized, and the Ethiopian eunuch, he's on cloud nine. And he probably thinks, oh, I'm going to have a wonderful time of fellowship with Philip. And what happened? The Spirit of God took him to the next soul, to the next work. Brothers and sisters and friends, support these brothers. They need your prayers. They need your support. They're going to face situations that they're going to be totally reliant upon the Spirit of God. They're going to ask the Lord for direction. The Lord's going to give it, and they're going to follow it. And that's what our, our faith and trust and dependence in God is all about, that we, we don't know the end outcome when we take, when we take the first step. 
but it's dependent upon the Lord. This is his church. He's going to lead us, and he's going to guide us. And as, as I said earlier, I want you to pray earnestly and fervently that if you don't feel that you have a work to do for the Lord, I want you to pray about that. Because the Lord needs workers. I said this a few weeks ago in, in Farmington Hills Branch that, you know, we, we come to a business meeting and it's time for election of officers. And, and all of a sudden, our two favorite words in our vocabulary are, I decline. You know, you, you've been there, right? I don't think it's any different in your branch than it is in mine. Thank God these brothers didn't decline. Thank God that you didn't decline your calling to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the Lord do his work with you. If you're newly baptized, just know that the Lord can keep you on that race and run it all the way to the end. If you've already been ordained, just know that the Lord can allow that you would fulfill that calling that he has given you. Because nothing is too great for the Lord. So brothers, in conclusion, I love you. May God bless you. And if there's anything we can do along the way to help you, to support you, and I would consider it a blessing and an honor to work with you out in the field. May God bless you. Morning, brothers and sisters. It's uh, an honor for me to be here as well. It's my first time in Monongahela on a Sunday. I was here years ago and just had a chance to see the building. Heard many wonderful things that happened here. And uh, today is no less than any of those things. It's a joy to be with you. I feel to relate to you one scripture I was pondering upon this past week. And you know, the, um, the calling of an evangelist is to go and to speak with those that have never heard the gospel. To take the gospel to those who don't understand what they may have heard before. To show them, convince them that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And I can tell you that our brothers are no stranger to this. As we call men into the office of an evangelist, we look for those who have already done some of the work, those who have the spirit to go out and to meet new people, to push the envelope of even their own selves in talking with people, maybe not even of their own language, but to get to know people who want to love the Lord and to show them that Jesus Christ is the way in this life. I was reminded this past week as I was studying the scriptures of the sons of Mosiah. They had an unquenchable spirit within themselves once they were converted themselves, once they gave themselves to be a servant of the Lord, that they could not rest. They had a desire even to go among their enemies to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ, to go back to the land of Nephi, to speak with the Lamanites, now, we don't have the record in the Book of Mormon that they were called evangelists, but I will tell you, these men exhibited the spirit of evangelism in their lives once they became a servant of the Lord. These men went to their father, the king, the king of all the land, and they asked permission to go and preach the gospel. They placed no limitations on where they would go other than to the Lamanites, how long they would stay there, when they would come back, they simply had a desire. And the desire they had within their soul is clear here. 28th chapter of Mosiah, it says, Now they were desirous that salvation should be declared to every creature. 
For they could not bear the, that any human soul should perish. Yea, the very thoughts that any soul should endure endless torment did cause them to tremble and to quake. These men have been to Africa. These men have been to the Native American people. These men have been to small branches and missions where there was a need. Whatever the need was, they fulfilled it. These men here, Aaron, Ammon, Omner, and Himni, they went out. The scripture says that they finally met each other when they came back after 14 years. Lisa and Rachel, we won't send them for 14 years. <laughs> but they placed no limit on how long they were going to be. At one point, Ammon says, I desire to stay among you, even perhaps until the day I die because he desired to gain the trust of that king that he might be able to tell them about Jesus Christ. These men and those of you who have experienced it, it is unquenchable within you. You will go wherever you need to, as Brother Wayne said. You will travel for hours and hours to meet one soul to tell them about Jesus Christ. Because within you, you know, if you don't give them that message, they might perish. That's the desire that these men have. That's what the Lord saw in them when he gave them experiences, when he gave us experiences, that they indeed should be called into the form of seven. So I would ask you today to think about, as Brother Wayne said, when you, the Lord, worked upon your heart. I remember being at school, never having heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ or the church of Jesus Christ, but having been blessed by a young man who was born and raised in the church, Ryan Ross, who was not baptized himself, but he wanted me to experience the love and the joy of the church and the salvation that the church offers. And many of you here today can remember those years. And you gave that love to me just as you've given it to other people as well. And so I rejoice in being with you today. I rejoice in the calling of our brothers and I rejoice that the spirit of evangelism is alive on this earth today, and we will convert the world. We will teach more people about the gospel of Jesus Christ than the devil will dissuade. The church is alive. We're working among Native Americans. We're working among the people in Asia, in Africa, South America, all over the world. We're telling them about Jesus Christ. We're telling them about the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the lost tribes of Israel, and they will come in, and we will build God's kingdom here on this earth. May God bless you. May you be blessed today to see the Lord call and seal this office upon our brothers. God bless you. I love each and every one of you, and I look forward to serving you more in the future. God bless you. Well, it certainly is a blessing for me to be among you. And among you uh, who are watching remotely now. And I want to thank God today for the opportunity to be with you. And the thing that is running through my mind, Brother Wayne said something, that if you don't want to know, don't ask. And that was pounding on my heart this morning because we have the truth in the church of Jesus Christ. And it's a great responsibility to bring the truth out to all of those dying souls that are in need. And I want to turn back to where Christ, our brother mentioned the, the blood that was shed and the sorrow. And when Christ went before Pilate, it was such, a, such an incredible moment. And we focus sometimes on the, the, the interaction with Christ, but I want to dwell just for a second on Pilate because he says some words.
that are profound at that point in time. So when Christ was brought before him, Pilate said this, he reviewed Christ. He was in a quandary. He was a leader of a group of people that had expectations of him. He had to keep order. He had to do what the, the, the will of the people was. But he was confounded because he got to spend a few moments with Christ. And he says these words, and they should echo in our ears, brothers. Pilate says this. He said unto him, what is truth? He looked at Christ. He interacted with Christ. He said, I know what you're accused of. And I hear your reply. And it doesn't make any sense to me. What is truth? And the, and the beautiful thing is, Christ was brought before him. And since this time, souls have sought Christ with the same question. What is the truth? Which way do I go? Which way do I turn? Joseph Smith himself, which, which church do I join? What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. He had found the truth. We have the truth. And we need to share the truth. And so how do we do that, brothers and sisters? I want to turn to 2 Timothy, because there's some great uh, advice here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When people go and they look and they seek and they cannot find, they go there on this journey, you can bring the truth. We can bring the truth to those that are seeking. It's a wonderful responsibility. Our brother Wayne laid that out very clearly. It's done by more than just two brothers or a group of brothers that go out two by two. It's done by all of the brothers and sisters, the family of the living God, the body of Christ. We labor together. We're joined in one another's worry and sorrow. We're arm in arm, steadfast in the truth. And what a beautiful gospel we have that has been restored. Because the scripture also says, the, the truth shall spring from the earth. And we have today the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ the most complete, the most replete gospel that is available today on the face of the earth. We have the truth. And it just struck me so hard when Brother Stacy talked about the four sons of Messiah because one of the things that I read last night was exactly at that 14-year point when they get back together and they have an opportunity to just reflect upon where they had been in life, in mischief, in, in activity that was anti-Christ, to a point that they were able to save the souls and, and bring the light of the gospel to the most remote places, the most, the most combative people. And it says this, when they get back together, it says, now the sons of Messiah were there. Elma at the, they were with Elma at the time the, first, the angel first appeared unto him. I'm sorry, I'm just going along, rambling along, trying to be quick, but I'm in Elma, the 17th chapter. And these words are so beautiful. It says, now the sons of Messiah were with Elma at the time that the angel first appeared unto him. And that's all, that was, has been one of my favorite scriptures for the longest time. When these who were rebelling against God 
going out and creating problems and mischief and wreaking havoc and making a, and making a mockery of God, an angel confronts them, the ground shakes under their feet, and they fall to the ground. And I, I, I'm paraphrasing it, but I love these words. The angel said unto them, who do you think sent me? You guys are out here bad-mouthing the living God, and you, you wallow at my feet. God sent me. You have no idea of the power of the living God. They got a small taste that day when Elma was like in a coma, right? And a, a, another one of my favorite parts of that whole scripture is that when Elma's dad found out, he said, hallelujah. <laughs> is it just me? Right? This terrible thing has happened to your son. Praise God. Now he knows. I've been trying to explain it to him. My words are, are small. God is enormous immeasurable. Now he knows. But it says this when they get together to rejoice. Elma did rejoice exceedingly to see his brethren. And, and, and what added more to his joy, uh, they were still his brethren in the Lord. 14 years later, trial after trial, issue after issue. All of those spirits that were overcome, Brother Wayne, that tried to make him stumble, tried to make him give up, tried to say, maybe I can't do this. Today I'm hungry. Tomorrow I'm tired. I've got no rest. The people, they won't listen to me. After 14 years of all of those spirits facing challenge after challenge after challenge, they were still brothers in Christ. And it goes on to say this, and they had waxed strong in the knowledge of the truth. They weren't, if they were relying upon themselves, if they were relying upon the knowledge of man, they would be as lost as everyone else. Unsure which way to go, how to combat this situation, or what choice to make. But they waxed strong in the truth. They understood the gospel. And it goes on to say this. And they were men of sound understanding, and they searched the scriptures diligently that they may know the word of God. But this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore, they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. And when they taught, this is one of my favorite lines. They taught with the power and authority, even with the power and the authority of God. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not our words. It's not, our, our, it's not simply our deeds when we're motivated to go and do the work of God. When it's seasoned with the spirit of the living God, the earth will shake. Mountains will be moved. And we do need to bring this, the, this message to the dying souls of men and women. And I said workmen in here, women, there's a great work to do. When we preach the gospel in India, it is the, it is the women that are there in our services in the middle of the day when the men are out working in the fields. It's the women who understand the truth of the gospel and teach it to their children and bring it into their home and make it part of their lives. It's the women that are out doing the chores and in, in one village and they go to do their laundry and they co confront another woman and say, tell her about the gospel. And guess what? The gospel moves forward. They tell the brothers of the ministry and the brothers of the ministry, go and explore. And there's a place for the gospel there because of a testimony over a washboard. Praise God. So let us be bold. We do need to help those that are in need. We do need to help those who do not have. We do need to bring to light to those that are in darkness. 
but we also have an we also have the responsibility to be steadfast and bold in the truth, not wavering left to right, not being dissuaded or discouraged, to go out and encourage even those that are courageous, brothers, to stand up when there's a giant that needs to be faced, to go to a place where there is sorrow and bring them comfort. May God bless us. May we share the truth in the spirit of God. Good for us to be here to support our brothers. And, uh, and, and you know, Josh had to get up and help me already. So. Uh, and I was thinking about Isaiah the prophet when he started preaching, when he started, when he had his first experience. That, and all of us are in the same boat as Isaiah. You know, somebody will say, well, that's Isaiah the prophet. He's one of the greatest prophets who ever walked in the Old Testament. He was spoken of by Jesus in so many places that it, it, it's an amazing thing. That Jesus said to read his words, for in them you'll find me. And, you know, when Isaiah was given this uh, experience, you wonder if he knew what was going to happen to him shortly after this. Would he have done that would he have answered, Lord, here am I. One of the things he did was he walked naked for three years preaching. Naked and barefoot. But everybody looked at me and went, that's what he did. He was so uh, dedicated to the words that he wanted to deliver to the house of Israel that as a, an example to them, that's what he did. But this is also the man who said, when he said, Lord, Lord, here am I, He's the man that sometime later on said, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And when he started speaking those words in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, he started talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. His mission as part of his life was twofold, in my estimation. Probably a lot more of that. But was one, to get the house of Israel to go into captivity with some ability to come out of it. And also to prophesy and preach about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he was doing that, it was an amazing thing. So I wonder as, as, a, as a minister, and as brothers and sisters, and as we all sit here, and as we start in the things we do in life, if we start what we're doing, wondering if we knew exactly what was going to happen for the next, how many years could be, a lot of years, short years, would we still do it? So here's, you know, I think of Moses. When he was at 40 years old, he goes to the backside of the desert, comes back 40 years later, leading the house of Israel through the, through the desert, right? Would he have done it had he known all of that? I believe, and, and whether, or Alma, the four sons of Isaiah, when they were converted and gave their, gave their lives to Christ, and Alma became the leader of the church. The four sons of Messiah went out on powerful missionary work, but yet they had challenges and they had things that they had to do that got through. And would they have done it had they known what was going to befall them? I'm going to say to you in my suggestion today that they would still do it. Because the blessings of God far exceed the challenges that we have in our lives. Isaiah, when he said, Lord, here am I, he went 
into a, he went into preaching the gospel. He went into speaking about Christ. He went into telling the house of Israel the different things they, they were in trouble with. But he also told them that they had a way of escape, that God would provide a way for them to come out. Now, I'm going to talk maybe a little bit to the young people about and all of us here for just a minute. And there was a time in the Book of Mormon when Jesus was gathered together with the people there and he looked at them and he said, I perceive you're tired. He said, I want you to come home. And I want you to think about the things I've just talked to you about. I want you to go away from here. Go back to your houses. And this is one of those places where Jesus tells them to leave. But it says that they fastened their eyes upon Christ with tears in their eyes and said to the Lord, stay with us a little. Did they change the direction of Jesus. Jesus, you know what his mission work was going? He was going to leave there right at that moment. And he was going to go starting to go to the other tribes of the house of Israel. Those tribes that were hidden unto the world, but not hidden unto my father, he said. He said, that's what I'm about to do. I'm going to leave. And as he's starting to do that, he looks at this congregation. He looks at this multitude of people, and they look at him, and they change his direction. And he says, I perceive. Uh, Sister Stephanie Cable with Stephanie Suspect. Little daughter, she was right. They were there. There's the children. We're all watching them. And we're getting ready to leave. And you know, Stephanie was slumber than this. She wouldn't know me from Adam. Other than the fact that her mother knows that we're, you know, that she I know her mother. Of course, Stephanie and, and her family have been part of our family for many, many years, like Josh and her father and sister Chris. At the end of that night, she jumped up in my arms. Now, you know what a child gives you a hug? Are you all smiling at that point? I know you are. Here is just nothing like it. And she hugged me, like wrapped around it, and we both started crying. Now, at first, I wonder why she cried. Is it me? <laughs> I don't know. And it was like time slowed down, slowed down, hug at me. We went our separate ways. Sunday morning came and I still had nothing. I am walking around with my electronic books, my little books. So I'm thinking, what am I going to speak about? I'm sitting at the breakfast table on my desk. I'm, you know, I'm doing one of these. And the Lord said to me, remember last night that hug? I said, yeah. Remember the day in this land when he says, I got the children together and I said to the people that my joy was full. And the people <clears throat> said that their joy was full. And the people were just so overcome. Angels descending out of heaven, ministering to the children, <clears throat> doing the things that they were doing. He said, when you and the hug school were hugging last night, and the joy that you felt that night, when you were in that brief moment, he said, that's what we felt on this land that day. That overpowering joy was what you felt last night when I blessed the little children. Now, why am I saying this? Because you know what the future of those little children was? 167 years of peace. That was the Zion of their day. Those children would live into that day with the power of God. And, then, and nobody had to say to them, this is what was going to happen. They knew that Christ was blessing them. They felt the power of God. They felt the manifestation of God's Holy Spirit. They felt the blood of the cross and the power of his resurrection in that moment. And for the next 167 years, they knew nothing but peace. They had joy. They had love. They had power. They healed. They had all the things. That, and those were the children that walked into that day. I don't know what my day is going to presume next time when I drive 
away from here for all that time. But I do know, like Jesus said to his disciples, you know, he said he came into the world to, 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 to take care of his own. He came into this world knowing where he was going. He said, I came into the world knowing that he was going to the cross. As for the joy that was set before him, he despised the cross and endured, despised the shame and endured the cross. So that we, that's Isaiah. When those children felt it, and brothers and sisters, it, all it took was for the multitude to give way. And I'm going to say to you, brothers and sisters and young people, let the Lord give way in your life. Because when you do that, I'm going to tell you that you will find things, you will sit in places, you will hear, like Paul said, I knew a man 14 years ago, whether in or out of his, he was caught up in the heavenly places. He felt the Spirit of God. Brothers and sisters and brothers, young people, I'm going to tell you that there is nothing that God cannot do with you if you give way. All you have to do is let, let God just step aside for that one moment and let God do what he wants to do. And he will bless you. He will strengthen you. You will sit in those heavenly places. You'll sit at the cross. You know, I, uh, I guess a uh, sister in our branch has passed out and our Lord Jesus passed away. She was 105 years old. You know when she was baptized? At 86. I may not have been a relative of hers, but I was. But I was a relative of her by the blood of the cross. Just like the sister, my brother, my brother. You know, I, you know, Josh and I used to play with uh, water guns, sometimes with hoses, and the occasional whipped cream can. We got in trouble for that one, didn't we? Nothing is impossible with God. And with God, all you have to do is make the first step. And then Jesus steps in. And when Jesus steps in, nothing is impossible. We will sit in heavenly places. We will have peace for whatever the amount of time, you know, whether it's a thousand years or not. We will have the, the, the ability to do the things God wants us to do. And he will give us the things we need to do. Just like that day back in Denver when I had nothing. You know what I did on Sunday morning to finish the story? Then I'll sit down. I said, brothers and sisters, thank God for what I'm about to say tonight. But I said, thanks, Swan, because she was a big part of it last night. And while I'm preaching, she runs up in the middle of my sermon, jumps up in my arms one more time, gives me a kiss, gets down, and goes and sits back down. That is what possible with God. Even babes, right, say wonderful words, and they praise Christ. We all are here today to support our brothers, but we are all here today because of the power of Christ and his resurrection. May God bless you is my prayer today. Amen. I'm getting nervous. It's usually never good to be the fifth speaker. So. <laughs> and I'm not going to be, I'm just going to uh, give you a few closing remarks until we have a greater and happy donations. So I enjoyed our brothers so very much uh, this morning. And the message was sure this morning that we would go out as our brothers. And we would spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, what we have received. Okay. As, as our brother Wayne read Isaiah, send me. Um, he, he, he gave us a challenge. How far would we go? You and I. And it's incumbent upon you and I that we would spread this gospel. That's the message that I got out of this today, brother. We can't just leave it up to the corner of 12. To spread the gospel, although very capable. We can't leave it up to only the form of 70 or only the ministry. 
But we have to leave it up to the church of Jesus Christ and you and I this morning. That we would spread this message and we would send this gospel out. Scripture says, Christ said, by the love ye have one another, you'll know that you're my disciples. They'll know. And I don't think that that means just among us, brothers. I can't believe that this morning. But I believe that as we show that to the world, they'll see that love that we have for them. And they'll know for sure that we're the disciples of Christ. So how much can we do this morning? I just want to share just a few verses. As my brothers were speaking, I thought about the woman at the well. Remember the woman at the well? Christ came to her. Listen, listen to just a few verses. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, meaning that water that she was going to draw from him. But then he told her, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give unto him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up unto everlasting life, telling her about who he was. And then they had a big conversation in between them. And at the end, and this is the part that I want to show you. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. That's what she was telling Christ. I know all about this. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee. It is I that, that is the Messiah. And that's the message that you and I know for a short in the swarm of who Jesus Christ is. And then she does something that just blows. It says that the woman then left her water pot right here. When Christ told her, it's me, she left her water pot. And it says she went into the city. And all of a sudden, just meeting the Lord, she said unto the men there, excuse me, it's, it's difficult for me to even see. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Proclaiming Jesus right on the spot. After just learning of who he was, she went out. Is not this the Christ? And then the last verse, and then we're going to go into our ordination. And it says, Then after they heard that, then they went out of the city and they came unto him. She proclaimed Christ. They left the city and they went immediately to Jesus because of this woman. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have a great job to do this morning. Our brothers are only a part of it. We're only a part of it. But we're all a part of it this morning. So may God bless us. I hope you were encouraged by the message this morning. It was sure this morning of what God's direction was. So praise God. Uh, we are going to have our brothers prepare to have their feet washed and be set apart. And uh, after we do that, after their feet are washed and they're set apart, we're going to form a circle just to let you know what's going to transpire. And uh, one of us is going to pray that the power of God will choose whom he felt to ordain our brothers into the form of seventy. So I just want to give you a little, little heads up of what's going to, what's going to go on. Uh, Brother Cameron, if you could come up as our brother prepare. Uh, thank you. Turn number 59 in the song of the 59. Sing all three verses.
start on God, you are great today. Holy Father, I kneel before my brother and I wash his feet, setting him apart today for this holy calling. Lord, last night you blessed me as I pondered upon his life and I thought about the day he was born. And Lord, he almost died as a child. I remember the testimony the saints prayed in conference for you, Jason. I remember the testimony of Grandma when she said Granddad came home with dead. He's dead. He's in God's hands now. <laughs> And I thank God that ever since you've been in the hands of God, he spared your life. And I thank you, Father, for giving me my brother. So many joyous memories. I thank you for the gift of life you've given him. And I thank you and praise you, Lord, how you have used him to this point. And I praise you, Lord Jesus, how you will use him to further the gospel even now and into the future. Lord, my words fail me today to praise thee sufficiently, but I glory today, Lord, as we set my brother apart for this holy calling. Father, I ask, Lord, for your blessing upon Jason, Lord, that he takes upon this responsibility. That, Lord, even as you said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I pray, Lord, that you would allow him, Lord, not only to just feel this responsibility, Lord, with pureness of heart, but, Lord, that you would ease the burden, Lord that he might feel you, Lord, lifting him up, Lord, in this responsibility. He might know the surety that you've called him, and you will carry him, Lord, to wherever you would take him. So bless these feet, Holy Father. May they publish great peace, Lord, upon the mountaintops, Lord, even the valleys, Lord, that you would take him. I pray a blessing upon these feet, that, Lord, they would bring peace to the souls of men and women. Lord, I ask a blessing upon his home. I ask a blessing upon his marriage and Rachel that you would bless her and continue to be with her oh father I pray for my nephews Rocco and Declan I praise you Lord how you bless them continue to bless them that they would be a blessing unto their father and unto her husband Lord Lord we love you and so Lord not to multiply many words I set my brother apart at this time May you bless him, Lord. Sanctify him and prepare him for this holy cause. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
as a child, you showed me that this day would come for my son. And we wait, Father, upon you and your will always. Lord, I pray now that as I kneel before him and wash his feet, Father, I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. And we set him apart for the calling that you have placed upon him this day. Oh, Lord, we look to you in much faith, and we pray, Father, that you would prepare him, Lord, for that place before him. Lord, in setting him aside, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would allow his eyes to be fixed upon your glory and your honor, Lord, that he's, these feet, Lord, that I wash would always be willing Father, to take him wherever you lead him, Lord. Bless him and his family, I pray, Lord, because they serve you together. I pray, Father, this day that you would hear my words, that you would grant them unto my son. These things we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, again, Lord, we continue in washing my brother's feet. And I look to you, Lord, this day, again, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And I am that you would be with Joshua and all that he does for you, Lord, that as his focus is upon your will and his life, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would always give him the words to say, that you would give him the spirit, Lord, to know, Father, inside when he is in your will, Lord, guide him and protect him, Lord, in all that you place before him, Lord. Let him, I pray, be a light and an example, Lord, to all those that he come in contact with, Father, Oh, we thank you and we praise you for the great gifts in our lives, Lord. And even, Father, this day that I have the opportunity to be here, Lord, we give thee the honor and glory and praise. Hear us, Lord, now, again, as we, in obedience to you and your Son, set our brother apart. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
as, as, we've, as we've talked before. Whoever feels to offer a prayer, I will kneel in a circle here. Uh, ask the Lord to choose whom he will to ordain our prayers. Dear Almighty God and Father, as we, as brethren and men before you, kneel before you this hour with humility and understanding of thy spirit, even this day, and as we each have sat in this chair ourselves and know of the importance of the gift of your spirit upon us, and dear Father, as we kneel before you, we call upon you that you would allow your spirit to descend this day. Even as each brother may be confirmed of thee, we ask, your Father, that you confer your spirit upon us, that we may ordain them by your gift this day. That it would be a demonstration of your power and authority that remains upon this earth in this latter day. And Father, as this is a changing moment in their lives, as we know of that importance, we call upon you with great humility this very hour of your love and your compassion upon us this day. Choose among us, Father, yes. and whom you would use this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ordain uh, Brother Josh. Uh, Josh, we put this oil on your head in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, in the holy name of Jesus, as my brothers and I stand around Brother Joshua, it is not by our might nor by our strength that this is here, but it is by your power and by your authority. And although I feel privileged to be able to do this, I feel unworthy. I've watched him grow since he was a little boy into the man that he is and the man of God that you have made him. And for that, I am grateful. I'm thankful for him as a son in the gospel. And thankful for the things that you have done for him. And today, Lord, you have brought him to this point in his life. And I know, Lord, that a responsibility of an evangelist is an important responsibility. And you have blessed him with this. And Lord, you have shown him that he is to be in this office. You have made this revelation to him known. You have made this revelation known to the church, to the Quorum of Seventy and the brothers as we encircle him. And it is by the power and authority of God that we do this. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless him. And you would strengthen his life. You would strengthen his words. You would strengthen his body and all the things that he needs to be able to walk the walk that he will take for the remainder days of his life. That Lord, as he does this, the words might come out of his mouth that would convert people that would show people the power of Christ and the love of Jesus Christ and the manifestation of your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray today that you would take care of him along with his wife, Sister Lisa, and their children. I pray that you would take care of them and that you would bless them as a family, that you would help them in their times when they have, this, have struggles. When there are times that they go through their lives and they have one need, I pray, Lord, that you would fill that need. In those times when, Lord, they are sitting in high places and blessings are flowing, allow us to flow with those blessings and allow us to feel that might. When Jesus ordained the Quorum of Seventy and sent them out, he sent them out two by two that they might prepare the way for Jesus, that they might show him, show the people that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
allow the words that will come out of Brother Joshua's mouth to be prepared and to be ordained by you and to show the world that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the anointed one, that he has come down from heaven and that he gave his life. And because of his life, many can have life. Allow these words that would come from him and the actions that he have would be powerful. That would be ordinary. That would be extraordinary today. We know, Lord, that they have been there and you the things that you have done with him have been a blessing in his life and have been a blessing to others. Now, oh Lord, I pray that as he goes from this chair that you would give him strength, that you would bless his life. Heavenly Father, having authority given me of Jesus Christ, Brother Joshua Nikolai, ordain you an evangelist in the church of Jesus Christ, that you may preach with the authority of God, that you may feel the power and might of the resurrection in your life, and that others might feel the power and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in all that you say and in all that you do. Amen. Amen. such a beautiful spirit so wonderful we're going to hear from our, our two brothers uh let them share uh this moment uh with each and every one of you then we're going to uh like to hear from just a few family members whoever feels to uh, maybe express themselves if you, if you don't feel to that we certainly that's fine and then we're going to hear from uh brother paul O'Malley. that's the hear from him brother frank as well we're going to hear from him as well so Brother Jason nominated me as a more seasoned evangelist. <laughs> come first. Uh, um, I was very thankful today, uh, not for anything that's happened, not for what he's uh, given me this day, but for what he's given me this life. Um, I, was, I was thinking this week, and uh, I've only ever shared this experience with one other brother, and that was Brother Jason. And uh, this experience happened years ago, and it, I don't think it really had anything to do with me and my calling or anything like that. But after hearing the, the words today, and um, I want to share it with you real quick. 
Um, this was following the, the passing of our brother Phil Jackson, who uh, was a, a region apostle when I was being ordained, an elder. And um, you know, he was one that would always look after the young brothers. <laughs> I remember one time I was at a conference, he called me into the corn meeting, or corn room and had a little meeting with me. At first, I thought I had done something really wrong. <laughs> he just wanted to talk with me to find out how things were going. And um, I had a dream after his death. It was probably a couple months. And, um, you know, Brother Phil was someone that, as I grew up in the church and was a teacher and started attending conferences, and you would hear from, from Brother Phil and the things that he was doing. And I'm not putting this to boast anyone up. In the dream, uh, we knew that Brother Phil was, was leaving us. And we were in Kinsmen. And many from the church had gathered because we wanted to, to see him go. He had a message. And I, I don't remember what was spoken of by Brother Phil that day, but as we always do when the service is over, you gather together, right? And you start talking. And I kept trying to, to push to Brother Phil. And eventually I got close to him. And Brother Phil said to the person next to me, and he said, I'm fearful I haven't done enough. And it had such an impact on my life because I've always not done enough. I've always fallen short. And to hear a brother say that, someone that I had watched growing up in the, in the, the ministry, in, in the fields, and even at the conference center, working with him to help build the conference center, hearing him and Brother Phil Bufa tell some crazy stories together. To hear him say, I fear that I haven't done enough. I uh, was able to have the profession I have. I chose the profession I have because I wanted to have availability to do things for the Lord. I changed my major with a year and a half left because I wasn't satisfied and I had to pick something new and I picked this for that very reason. We're not saying that there's anything special with me, but as we heard today, all you need to be is willing. And that's all I ever wanna be. I don't care what I do. I don't care where I go. I just pray that God wills it to me in my life. You know, and I was thinking today or this week and the story of uh, Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus, if you're a little kid, because it has to go with the song, right? Came to me. And you know, as he was there, the people were all over the place and all he wanted to do was get to Christ. That's all he wanted. The only thing he, he thought to do, it says he was a small man. So what did he do? He climbed the tree. He got higher. He found it in himself to do something different. He knew his limitations. He climbed the tree. And who found him but Jesus Christ? and said, come with me, we're going to your house today. We all need to climb higher. We all need to step beyond our limitations. You know, to, to be able to, to think back in the, in, the, in the years and to say that I would be at this point, I'm, I would never have guessed this because I know of myself, I can't do these things. You know, Brother Jason, he's a, he's a salesman, right? He's good on cold calls. Me, it scares me to death. <laughs> but I have to. Because I don't want to think and say back in my life that I'm fearful I haven't done enough. And I want that burden to be felt by me. 
And I want that burden to be felt by all of us to know that there are individuals out there who don't have what we have, who've never heard the story of Jesus Christ, who've never felt that in their lives. And I want to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life to know that it's my responsibility and all of our responsibilities to make sure that this world knows the story of Jesus Christ. That they might know how to gain salvation. That they might live in a, in a, in a life that is solely focused on him. And we find peace and comfort in his teachings and his commandments and his will in our life. I thank God for all of you out there. Um, you know, this, thinking this week, I've, I've spent time in Monongahela over the years in Greensburg and Roskill and the many friendships and, and that have, have developed over the years and those that have been uh, mentors to me. And uh, thank God for my family, my wife and my children, my parents, my extended family who's all here. Thankful that they agreed one day and they shared that legacy with me. And there are many generations in my family who can say that. But you know, it all came down to one person having to make it, that decision for themselves. And as much as I've heard about things in my family and read the things that they've done in the history books. It doesn't matter. I had to be willing to do something myself. I had to be willing to acknowledge my own sins, my own transgressions, to seek after Jesus Christ in my life. And I'm thankful for all those out there. For my wife, who's been so supportive of me over the years, and you know, oftentimes when I am feel to do something and, and, and agree to it, I then have to go tell her I've done it and uh, sort of ask permission afterwards. Um, she's never said no. And uh, so it's a support she's been to me over the years. I know she'll continue to do that. And I remember uh, my first trip to Africa and, and coming back, um, talking with her, and she was a little upset. And I thought she was upset with me. And she was upset that she didn't go. And uh, I know she's not always able to go. I know we're not always able to do everything. But the prayers of the saints keep that mission and keep that path going forward. So continue to pray. Continue to be the support that's needed for the church in whatever way it is. And if the time comes, please climb that tree to find Jesus Christ. God bless you. A lot of thoughts going through my mind um, as I, uh, first of all, I just have coming off of my part of the presidency of the GMBA and turning my attention towards another responsibility. Um, I want to publicly thank my wife uh, for her support and, uh, you know, Everyone's prayed for, for my wife. It's no, no secret, but she has the eye of the tiger. And she's fought for our family. And there's times where she says to me stuff like, well, you're going to go anoint that person? Are you gonna, what are you doing? You know, and so I thank God for her and my, my boys and, you know, all my family that's here, my in-laws, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, my father, who's taught me how to be a man. My mother, whose unfeigned faith was in her, which first dwelt in her mother, and her mother before her. Um, I think of a time when my niece, I was getting married to Rachel, and my niece, Carly, you know, she was at a certain age, so she knew things were going to change, and she was all upset. 
And my brother and sister-in-law told me, you know, where he lived, lived in Oakdale. He, she's all upset. You're getting married. You're, you know, changing your focus. And I remember I, I told them I want to take her with me for a moment. I took her down to the middle of Oakdale at Sills. And I told her she'll always be my best friend. And we stood in the middle of Oakdale and raised our hands and we screamed, best friends forever. Okay. To the young people that are here, I want you to know that you're always worth my time. Uh, that's a part of what the Lord has given me, a responsibility and a calling, and that doesn't change. Um, when I was ordained a deacon, my, my grandfather washed my feet, Frank D'Antonio. And I became a servant of the Lord that day. And I'd like to hope that I've never turned back. And I've done as the scriptures have said that I have addicted myself to the ministry of the saints. And uh, I've got a taste of, of, of servant, being a servant to each and every one of you. And I thank God for those that have given me that example in my life. Importantly, of the love of Jesus Christ. And Brother Ralph, when I was called to the church, he placed upon me the gift of charity. And my uh, family has a wonderful testimony when the simplicity of the gospel came to our home. Brother Philip Maleko preached the gospel. And as Brother Josh says, kind of felt like my great grandfather thought he had, he had nothing to offer. But the Lord spoke to my great grandfather that day and said, today, you're going to hear a sermon like you've never heard before. And the gospel came to my family and their home. They were baptized. My great grandmother knelt in the waters of baptism because she tasted of the goodness of Jesus Christ. And there have been many that have uh, kept me to this day that aren't here. Some that are here like Brother Lou D'Angelo. Brother Chet Nolfi, those that had time for me to love me. And uh, I just want to thank God today. And uh, for each and every one of you that are here, I solicit your prayers. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something. When I sit down, I'll tell Josh I forgot about this or that. But I guess the most important thing I'll say is it comes down to that I love each and every one of you. I love the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for me from a young age. I've seen the hand of God in our home and our lives. I have my second born son who is an absolute miracle before my eyes every day from what I saw. And the Lord sent his angel to watch over my son. And I pray that the Lord would send his angels to watch over my ministry. That uh, we might say, as brother Josh says that, that the Lord has been with us and we're just willing to go and the Lord will give the increase. So I love each and every one of you who pray for us. I thank God for this, his trust in me to grant unto me the privilege to have this office. But really to me, I, we continue to do what we've been doing. And that is to tell people that Jesus has arisen and that he offers you salvation to your life. We'll do that here, and we'll do that in every corner that we get to where we're asked to go. We'll do it with the, with the Lord's help. So may God bless each and every one of you. Just going to take a few minutes and open it up for any of the immediate family that might want to express themselves. Feel free to do so at this time. You're the oldest. <laughs> You're the oldest cousin.
And um, when um, Jason was born, he was taken to the hospital. My dad and Leo all were there. And um, he just wasn't breathing, right? And they would have to do this on the bottom of his feet to get it to breathe. And I remember my sister said, you know, the Lord knows because he is never going to be still. And that's the truth. He has never been still. And um, <coughs> when Dr. Kim had to wash his feet, I immediately remembered when my dad washed their feet when they were dead. Mm -hmm. And um, I did think my dad said to them, don't be jealous of each other because he told them. But um, when he was ordained as elder in the Green Field Auditorium, um, my husband said to me, no, I'm not getting up. I'm not going to stay in the Yeah, you know, he doesn't know that. So I'm sitting there, and I wanted, I'm wanting to get up, but I was frozen in my seat because I wanted to avoid the conversation. And I wanted to get up. Where are you? Is it there? All of you. He has said a good day or not. And he has breathed a blessing from all of you. So we got to do that today. Um, but it's the truth. And so, but that day, my husband stood up. He wore me. And he told an experience he had when he was on his post in Germany in the army. I never heard this. I don't know how long we were married then. I never heard this. <laughs> he was on his post in Germany. He was an MP. He was walking with the gun on his arm at night. And he said, he goes, what? And he asked God, this is before I met him. He asked God, what do you have for me when I get home? And he heard a voice say, I got me family. <laughs> And I met him when he got out of the service. So I just thank God for, for this day. I thank him for my family. I, I love them all. I love all of you very much. It was a blessing watching you up here this morning singing. And I received a great blessing. So I thank God. I'll pray for me. I'll pray for you. <laughs>
So good afternoon to each of you. Uh, we will be, uh, we'll be brief. Um, brothers, you know we love you. We had a chance to greet you. This is a historic day for the Church of Jesus Christ. Think about it that way. It's a historic day. We have two brothers that have been ordained evangelists for the entire world. That's praise God. Praise God. Our, our brothers are going to be concerned with souls all around the globe and next door and in the bedroom 20 feet down with their, with their two children each. Because you're evangelist in your home, your branch, and around the world. That, that you might bring souls to Christ 
And, um, you know, the Lord's been with you, brothers. I, a little bit, um, I, I kind of remember certain things. Brother Jason was at April 91. Was that around? What time April, you got? April 7, like April 7, 91. Yeah, it was pretty close. Brother Josh was at uh, September, was it 99? <laughs> So it's just, it's just me. I like to remember kind of things. And I didn't go on the rip system and look it up. Okay? I really didn't. <laughs> but the Lord was with you ever since the brothers brought you out of the water. And uh, the Lord's going to be with you, brothers. Um, as a church, as a church leadership, we need you. We need you. The world needs you. Because you have been given a gift to tell people. And Brother Josh, if you know how to ask forgiveness after, you already know the main point of sales. But if you understand how beautiful it is today, and brothers and sisters, I am very thankful to be here. It's a great day for the church. Beautiful crowd. And I want to give I want to give way to Brother Frank here that he might have a chance to lend his voice and praise to God. But we're thankful. We're thankful as a church that we're here, and we're, we're positive of God's calling. On a personal note, I had an experience about these two brothers one month before the pandemic hit, and I'm thankful to be here today. Thankful to be here, that the Lord spared us, that we could see our brothers, and to our, our, and to our congregation, you need to pray for them. When you hear they're going somewhere, pray for them that they would have the same report of the original 70, that they would come home rejoicing. Not that every trip is a success. It's not always, brothers. But that they would have the joy of the gospel upon their faces at all times. And brothers, 2 Timothy, 4th chapter. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that thou walk fit first, but watch thou in all things. Your leadership just got to another level today. Endure afflictions. You've both done that in your family. You've both had afflictions in your family. Do the work of an evangelist. And make full, and this is the part I love, brothers, make full proof of your ministry. The Lord is with you when you were teachers. The Lord is with you when you were elders. He is going to be with you as evangelist. That souls might come to Christ. Mm-hmm. That your greatest joy will be when you stand in the waters. That doesn't matter if you're in the, what is it, the Monongahela River here, the creek or pond, whatever we use in Aliquippa, or whether you're overseas, that you might raise your hand and say, having authority, give me of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. And that joy, that joy will make every frustration part of that trip worthwhile, okay? Right, brothers? For sure, amen. Every, every frustration part of that entire journey gets wiped away then. Brothers, do the work of an evangelist. And we are thrilled, we are thrilled today to have you on the core of 70, that you might additionally bring souls to Christ. And as our brother Joel told us last month as a church, that you might build up the kingdom of God, that we might bring forth that Zion that has been promised in scripture, that Israel might have joy. That's your charge today. May God bless you. Brothers and sisters, when you're the seventh or eighth or ninth speaker, (laughs) you wonder how many hours will he preach? (laughs) But we, uh, like all of you, count it a joy to to be here today. And, you know, let me just um, pause. There's all kinds of things up here too far away. Um, Let me just pause for a moment and have you uh, answer a few questions for yourself. I'm gonna ask the questions you don't need to answer. Why did you come to church today? Did did you come because you wanted to receive a blessing? Did you come to maybe honor these brothers and to show your love for them? Did you come because you enjoy the fellowship of the saints and the excitement of being able to be together and and to fellowship and, and, and share a meal? 
to pray together, to sing together. Did you come because maybe mom and dad said this is the right thing to do, get dressed, we're going to church. Right? Did you come because, well, this is what I do every Sunday. A lot of different reasons why, why we find ourselves here. Sometimes it's because of love for individuals. Most importantly, I, I trust we all can say it's our love for Jesus Christ. It's our love for the Christ who died for us, who sacrificed his life, that we might have hope and joy of salvation. As our brother said, to build the kingdom here and to one day receive an eternal crown, a reward, a mansion. A lot of different motivations that would drive us to come to church. And for some of us, we were born and raised. Some of us were invited to come, and we weren't born and raised in the church. A lot of different experiences that come up from that. And while I enjoyed, and I know you enjoyed the words that our brother spoke, how, how do you go wrong when you speak of the prophet Isaiah? And as Brother Wade opened to that. I mean, talk about a, a foundation to build on, as our brother shared. And, and not only to talk about experience or uh, scriptures, but, but you see kind of mingled in the experience. And Brother Jim was sharing this experience of, of how this, I don't know how old she was, this young girl, you know, embraces him. And, and how we share experiences, whether it's personal experiences or in our families or years ago of how the Lord speaks to us. And that's what makes the church of Jesus Christ and our relationship with Christ so precious and so real and so valuable. It's not just words on a piece of paper that we come to church to read and to listen and to say, praise God, amen, and I'll go home now. It's more than that for us. It, it's, it's a way of life. It's become a, it's become a lifestyle for us to, to just to kind of wait and almost, you know, just cringe on the, cringe isn't the right word, um, hang on the words of someone in their testimony. You know they're going to get to a point where they're going to share something that was miraculous, that somehow God touched them in their lives, something made a difference. Whether, whether sometimes we understand it or not, years ago, just yesterday, last week, last month, those testimonies, those experiences keep you and I engaged and alive. And it's a reminder that the Christ whom we serve is alive and well and active in our lives. And today we saw, the, I'll say, the manifestation of that as we have ordained two new brothers now into the corner of seven. And I believe, those days, there's still openings. Oh, yeah. There's still positions to be filled. You know, when I was a young man, before I was ordained in the ministry, I remember visiting in Muncie, Canada, with the saints there. I was a young man the gospel. And visiting, visiting there. I remember being up front singing, and then we had a moment of testimony. And I remember saying to the brothers and sisters there, someday I desire to be an evangelist in the church, not because I want a position in my mind. I wasn't thinking that. I just wanted to tell others about Jesus. And if that meant being an evangelist, then I want to be an evangelist. And they looked at me. And I was probably too naive and, and just too, you know, unconnected to know what I was saying. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to say, hey, look at me, look how good I am. I, I want position. I just wanted to tell everyone how much I love Jesus. And from a young age, young in the gospel, I had a desire, desire to tell others about Christ. Now, what I heard today preach was that we all need to have that desire. It's not about, well, you're an evangelist, so you need to tell others about Jesus. We all own that responsibility, and it's not a burden, is it? It's a joy to tell others about what we have received in our life. It's a joy. These brothers have given a, a position of leadership, of responsibility, to inspire you to do more of that. That's all they're being done. I'm, I'm minimizing their calling, and I don't want to do that. It's not my intent. But they're being called to that leadership role. We are all called to share the joy of Christ with others. There's openings. There's openings in the army of the Lord. And he calls every day. He extends his arm 
of invitation. To some, it's to repentance. To others, it's to fill a position. Brother Wade, I've never said I decline. I've never said that. And it doesn't mean that I'm competent, and it doesn't mean I could fill every office in the church, elected office. But I always had a desire to say, well, I'll try. I'll do that. How bad can I do? Well, how big a mistake can I make? There'll be somebody else to help me out, somebody else to lift me up, they'll correct me. And I remember being corrected, and that was fine. We're in this together. This is our church. We all fight the battle. We're not here to lift one another up, well, point the finger there, do that. We're all in this together to build the kingdom. And it starts with the people of God, and that we might extend those invitations. Whether that's an invitation to repentance, whether that's an invitation to fill an office, elected or ordained. Desire to put Christ first in your life. And that's what these brothers have done. Christ first in your life. And so at a young age, this is the deal I made with the Lord. I'll share it with you. And if you want to jump on board with this deal, feel free. Because it's worked pretty well for me. This is what I said to the Lord. I will go anywhere and I will do anything you want me to do. Simple as that. Why did I feel that way? Because not being born and raised in the church, not having this in my life from a young age, when I found the pearl, all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do, and I believe it's true for all of us, is to share what Christ has given to us with others. Of those who have been given that responsibility and that role of a leadership to be able to inspire others, to touch their hearts, not just to, to uh, work within the church and to lead within the church, but to touch the lives of those beyond. So we're thankful today. Thankful to see, as Brother Paul said, a uh, historic moment. We don't think always in terms of, well, you know, small church, just two brothers, two men, we know them. You know, they have faults, so... It's historic. Keeping those humble. No faults. It's historic. Historic because brick by brick, the kingdom is built. Brick by brick. We all own part of that. Some mix the mortar, some lay the brick, some make the brick, some design. But in the end, God gives the answers. And that's what we make of this, that men and women might find Christ. So, a joy to be here today. Pray for the priesthood. That the Lord might use these brothers behind me. And those who are sitting in the congregation today. Pray that as spiritual leaders, we would follow the will of God. Pray for one another. As a people of God, no matter what we face, no matter what challenges in our lives personally or as a church, that we would be united under the banner of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. That we might lift up the name of Jesus in all things. May God bless you, my prayer today. There's a whole bunch of microphones here that are all, all wrapped up into a bundle now. <laughs> I think I have the right one. <laughs> Have you been blessed today? Thank God for that. We're going to take time at, uh, at this moment to um, administer the Lord's Supper. We, uh, to our visitors, are uh, very thankful that you're here. But just to clarify, we of the church of Jesus Christ. For everyone. Please go down and, and have lunch. I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. And eat cake. There's a lot of cake. <laughs> eat cake. That's all I'm going to tell you. Eat cake.
Um, <laughs> real quick, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, I'm big on this, that we, that we pray for one another, that are afflicted and that are sick. And you know who they are. I can't announce everyone that's sick and afflicted. You know who they are. We want you to continue to pray for them. That's our recourse, that we would approach the throne of God boldly on behalf of our brothers and sisters. I just want to mention a couple that came to, to mind recently. I don't know if you heard, Brother Zach Jackson is in the hospital with COVID. COVID rages on, but Christ rages even further than that. So we praise God for that. So uh, remember, Brother Zach, Brother Wayne introduced our service uh, last week with a stroke. I don't know if you know that. Uh, she's in the hospital currently. Her daughter is with her at this time. She's only allowed to see like one person a day. A day. So her daughter is spending time with her. Also, Brother Wayne's uh, mother, Luna, whom Brother Wayne has been the caregiver all these years, has pneumonia, struggling, struggling. And we don't, we don't want to see that. So uh, we want to remember them as well. Um, with that, I, I don't think I have anything else other than if anyone needs to be anointed, we didn't really provide much time for that. Please uh, see one of our brothers here on the ministry, and we will take time to anoint you after the meeting. Having said that, we're going to uh, we're going to not have a closing hymn, and we're going to rise to be dismissed. And I'm going to ask other members. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I just want to make one short announcement. We did recommend six brothers to be ordained evangelists at this past conference. Brother John, Brother Josh, and Brother Jason. All the J's have been taken care of. <laughs> Next week in California, Brother David Ariola and Brother Daniel McNamara will be ordained evangelists. And the following week, Brother Randy Sicotti will be ordained in Florida. So remember them in prayer as well. Let us bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord, even as we pray with a thankful heart. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before thee with thankful hearts, O Lord, praising your name, O Father, for the Holy One of Israel, who has told us, O Lord, as a glorious church, that all power was given unto him, O Father. And therefore, he gave us, O Lord, the commandment, O Lord, to go into every corner of this world, O Lord, taking that precious, pure gospel that has now been restored. And so we are thankful, Lord Jesus. We're th thankful, O Father, for what you have done with thy precious church, even to, to this day. And O Father, as we leave here, we pray, O 